All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Kyle Warner, the director of the North Dakota Aeronautics Commission. I want to welcome all of you to the 2016 Upper Midwest Aviation Symposium and to this uh, aerial applicator safety meeting. So by attending this aviation sa uh, safety seminar today or by uh, viewing this video online, um, you're uh, fulfilling your, your annual requirement to act as an aerial applicator in the state of North Dakota. Uh, we're also recording this event for those aerial applicators not able to make this event today. So if you're watching this online, make sure that you're taking the, the questionnaire after this video to ensure that we, we know that you watch the video and are in compliance. Uh, so from comments that we received last year uh, from video participants, we want to make sure that they can hear uh, everybody in this room when you're asking questions. And so if you have a question for any of our speakers, please raise your hand and I'll come uh, with the microphone uh, to you so that you can make sure that everybody online uh, watching this presentation can hear uh, your question. Uh, so with that, uh, we have many wonderful speakers here uh, to visit with you today, and I hope uh, that this session helps to energize all of you to have a safe and efficient aerial applicator season here in uh, 2016. So with that, I'll, I'll hand it off here uh, to Andy Tybert, who's going to talk about dynamic propeller balancing and maintenance records. So let's give uh, Andy a round of applause. Thank you. Again, my name is Andy Tybert. I'm an ag pilot out of Grafton, North Dakota. Um, First of all, I wanted to start off by saying uh, my, my co-presenter uh, could not attend today, so uh, the uh, dynamic propeller balancing presentation will be the, uh, down to uh, that you should do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a lot of places say every uh, thousand hours, but uh, 500 or, or annual, whichever is around that area, and uh, he promised to show up next year and do a full presentation on what, why you need to do it and uh, what, what he's looking for on his machines when he does it. And um, uh, with that, I'll just move on to the next subject. <laughs> um, a couple of years ago, I uh, installed a uh, inline filter. Uh, this is just a filter housing. It's hollow right now, but this filter actually goes in there. And I installed this inline filter on my incoming air, just the, the ventilating air. My aircraft is equipped with air conditioning, and I do run it a, somewhat, but on days when it's very hot and you're in and out of the aircraft several different times, um, you tend to start getting, a, I do anyway, tend to start getting a sore throat and, and uh, different stuff. It's almost like a air conditioning induced cold. But I mostly wanted to just pass around this filter. Uh, this is simply one year of running of fresh air coming into the cabin. And the other part about this that I noticed is that sometimes on beautiful evenings when the chemical is a little slow of settling down and you're coming for a cleanup pass or something like that, pretty soon you'd see a little bit of this. I think there were some chemical particles coming right through the fresh air which was completely unfiltered um, and, and ended up inside the cockpit with you. Uh, when I installed this, uh, that completely eliminated that. So all the, you want to take a look at that and just pass it around the room. Um, these units are only about uh, completely done. They're only about two pounds, all said and done, and just splice it into your, um, into your fresh air line, which is usually a four inch, um, excuse me, three inch line coming uh, from your scoop on the side of the airplane. Though it isn't so much of a concern for those, again, that are running air conditioning all day long, but I generally don't. Uh, so uh, pass around this filter housing and you guys can take a look at that. If anybody's interested in that, contact me uh, sometime. We'll talk more about it. The next area that I wanted to touch on uh, we, uh, we still continue to have some issues with water and fuel. And uh, I think just recently some, some airplane made the news that uh, ended up with, from my understanding, I haven't heard this officially, but uh, my understanding is that it was stopped because of water contamination. I, I won't go so much into detail on that particular one because uh, I, I am only hearsay on the, on the uh, details about why that quit. But um, we all have these in our tanks, in our header tanks, uh, th 
pretty typical to have a Curtis drain valve to uh, drain off any water or contaminants. Uh, these are all ones that I have removed over the last year or so, and every one of these is stuck. If they're stuck, there's no way to drain your water. How are you going to know if you have it in your system or not? So uh, these things are relatively inexpensive, very easily changed. Keep them, keep them up and working. Lube them up once in a while. You can just shoot a little uh, penetrant oil on them. That keeps them, keeps them nice and working and exercise them. I had one of our pilots say to me one time, he says, well, I never push it because when you push them, they always leak. Yeah. Oh, okay, I understand what you're saying, <laughs> but <laughs> it's kind of a, kind of a bad deal. That's what, they're, that's what they're all about. I'll just uh, set these here and you can pass them around. Um, this, uh, I had one that was dripping, okay? So I'm gonna change it and I get a pail and I just, I clean it all out and, um, and when I pulled the valve out, I let a fair amount drain into the pail. And this is, uh, so this is a picture looking into a pail. This is all the crud that I got out of there. So I can see where they, where they do, uh, oop, other way, uh, where they do leak with uh, stuff hanging up. And, uh, and as I took out the one that I was changing out, uh, there was a bristle from a wire brush stuck right where the o-ring is. And, uh, and along with some sand and a couple of paint chips, and I was happy to say there is no water in there, but, uh, <laughs> but about every second or third year, we take that header tank out of that airplane and shake it out and, and get all this stuff out of there once and for all, but, uh, and, and sooner if we see any contaminants. So, Um, I'm seeing that a lot of this stuff is coming from fuel farms. Fuel storage is a whole nother issue. Just be cognitive and aware that most of this water isn't coming direct into the airplane. It's coming through the fuel farms, the fuel storage facilities. So just uh, we'll touch on that maybe another time or, or somebody else can uh, uh, pick up that subject alone. So any questions on, the, on that? I'm sure all of you have probably run into those leaking valves and stuff. We keep a half dozen of them on hand all the time. And if they give problems, uh, you can uh, just, just change them out. In a pinch, in a pinch, I have taken an, an, a portable air hose with a rubber tip and take off your fuel cap and push the valve up and blow backwards back into the tank. It will blow like if you're somewhere remotely located and just in a pinch for one or two times, but you should find the source of what, what is hanging up that valve uh, or making it leak. Okay, no questions on the fuel at all? Okay, uh, the other subject I was gonna touch on is, is maintenance records. And um, it was kind of one we touched on last year a little bit, and a few had responded that they wanted to hear more about that. Um, all airplanes are going to have some kind, of, some kind of maintenance due throughout our season. Hopefully, if we're lucky enough, we put on enough hours that we do run across uh, some necessary maintenance. And whether it's uh, uh, ADs, uh, whether you just do a 100 hour, you know, pull off the cowling, see if everything is hanging on there, and lube a few things up, and just check things over. Or um, uh, there's other events uh, that come up, uh, uh, fuel nozzles if you're running a turbine, uh, ro setting rocker boxes or oil changes on recips, that comes up. And, and it w when you're the most busy, boy, those dates will sneak up on you, or not only dates, but mostly hours will sneak up on you pretty darn fast. So we need some way to, how do you keep track of that? Or whose responsibility is it? The, the responsibility ultimately lies on the owner operator. But is he fluent on ADs or wh when you start talking about nozzles, uh, stuff like that, it isn't really, he's responsible for getting it done, but the mechanic is ultimately responsible for doing it. It's a, it's a complex operation and, and shouldn't, 
you know, should be done by, a, by an A&P at least. Um, but to keep track of the times uh, of when this comes up, um, you, you're going to have to develop some type of system to keep track of these times. And if you just simply go with uh, some maintenance due, some things due, and you and your mechanic work out uh, the time and make a note of it in the cockpit, or uh, I have some other examples here. We have multiple airplanes, so we post those times when the annual is due. Uh, like, uh, is there a pointer on here? Oh, okay. Um, when nozzles may be due, uh, and I, when I took this picture, I'm sorry, I, you could see the, the lights in our office here were reflecting off this board. I didn't know it was that bad. But um, on the air tractors, this uh, 122 Hotel Foxtrot happens to be an air tractor. So we have an AD due every 100 hours on the engine mount on that aircraft. And so at least uh, someone can see somewhere, whether the pilot or the mechanic, can see that uh, this is coming up. And, and we make a note of this in the cockpit also. Uh, here is another one, a status sheet. You can, you can put your, uh, you know, we normally carry one of these. This is filled out by the mechanic at, uh, at the time of the annual. So you can know when the annual is due, 100 hours fuel nozzles, oil samples, all that stuff is, is due. And then which ADs are due at which hour, because sometimes those may not be the same, same hours. One might be every 500 hours or one might be every 50. So, and then there's a note, you know, area to just make some notes to hand back, hey, you need to check out this or that, so. I think uh, that's about it. Um, but uh, the main thing is to communicate with your mechanic. Decide who's, who you're going to put this responsibility on, who's going to watch the times. Uh, we have our mechanic calling out to the pilots, tell me your Hobbs time, tell me your Hobbs time. And, uh, and uh, so he knows he has about 50 hours or 10 hours left or whatever the case may be. He can follow up very closely as that time starts, starts approaching. And, uh, and make sure that 80s or, or anything isn't overrun. Um, lastly, if you have multiple airplanes, might be you know, time to assign a director of maintenance uh, to, to follow up on this, because that, that gets to be, when you have one operation, or one aircraft in the operation, it's relatively simple. But if you have multiple, it's, it's really time to you know, assign someone to follow through with those times. Any questions on anything? Oh. Nope, yes. Real quick. Well, just that it, it is the uh, owner operator's uh, responsibility to keep up on the ADs and the, keep track of the maintenance, not the mechanics. That is correct. The owner operator is at least responsible to make sure that it is done. Ultimately, the mechanic will do it, but it is, but you're correct, it is the owner operator that uh, is to assure that it is done. Any other questions for Andy? All right, let's look. When you do that uh, fuel tank uh, drain replacement, you know, in the center header tank, wouldn't that, isn't that kind of difficult to get out on an air tractor? Uh, some can be. Uh, yes, you're correct. If, if it's recessed in there somewhat, uh, Curtis actually does develop a socket. So you'll notice several of these are somewhat rounded off. I have not purchased that socket, but they do specifically make. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they do make a socket that, that uh, uh, is slotted to go over those two. Um, uh, bars sticking out that you operate it by. Okay. So you can get it out if it is recessed and it avoids stripping it. Sure. I got one for you, Andy. Would it be possible to have you share that sheet 
with the other operators on maybe a website somewhere. I don't know if it, you know, so that people could go and download that sheet if they need it. Yes. Uh, I could uh, provide it to the Aeronautics Commission as a PDF or something like that. That'd be a good source, then they could stop, get the sheet, and it would help them keep track of their maintenance. We have a Facebook page, too. That's right. The NDAAA. Okay. I'll get it to uh, Dave and also to the Aeronautics Commission, and they can post it on along uh, yeah. as an attachment that, to this presentation. That's a great comment. That's, we'll look at doing that then. Okay. Any other comments, questions? Great. All well, right. Let's give Andy a round of applause. Thank you. Our next pre uh, presenter for you today is Jeremiah Lean from the Department of Agriculture, here to give you an update. So let's give uh, Jeremiah a round of applause. All right, thank you. So I'm just going to get right into it, so we uh, so I can get you, get you guys on your way. Um, one of the things that continue to be an issue, of course, is drift, and more than likely you'll hear about it uh, all the time. Um, if somebody files a complaint against you, the inspectors will go out, they'll do their investigation, they'll talk to uh, both parties. They'll take samples, they'll send those samples in. If it comes back with what you were spraying, then you can imagine probably how the outcome will, will be. Um, and increased public concerns. The reason why I put that in there, there's a lot of uh, people that have moved here from all over the United States. And a lot of times they assume that we do things uh, here the way they uh, did things wherever they came from, be it California or wherever. And so we'll get calls into the office asking if, uh, you know, can they be out there spraying? Um, uh, do they have to call into a national registry first or some type of registration base, uh, uh, database? And so we'll ask them, is it really windy out where you're at? And if they say no, well, okay, is it, are they spraying on your property? If they say no, well, then we say yes, they can be out there. They have every right to be out there just as much as anybody else. But just be aware, if you, especially if you are doing something that you're probably not supposed to be doing, it's probably the, a lot more likely that somebody will call in about it. <laughs> I don't know if it's forwarding here. It seems like it's locked. Following along with that, we've also had a significant increase in human endangerment cases the last couple years. Now this is both with aerial applicators, ground applicators, ornamental and turf applicators, and egg applicators, so it's all across the board. Now one thing we do is we take that very seriously. I mean, if you spray somebody or drift onto a person, um, and so there won't be any warnings. It'll be a fine and uh, generally it's uh, fairly costly. Uh, it goes along with the same thing. If somebody feels like they were drifted on, they call, the inspector will show up. The only difference is, is instead of just taking samples, they'll ask them if they can take a piece of, say they had a t-shirt they were wearing or whatever, and they'll send that in to be analyzed. And if it comes back again with what you were spraying, then again, um, you know, and along with some other factors, but uh, you can generally the outcome is not a favorable one. Uh, so the biggest thing is to be cognizant of your surroundings. I tell this to all applicators. It's a, you know, it's a little bit different for aerial, but um, still just as important. If somebody's, you know, if you see somebody jogging down the road or something, uh, wait until they're further down the road or out of there. Uh, if there's, if you notice people out in a uh, farm farmstead right next to the field and there's people running all over the winds blowing that way um, you're just asking for uh, probably a call into the um, for them to call and file a complaint and uh, so it's 
you know, it's obviously more difficult for you guys because you're getting a call and you're flying out. Uh, you have no idea if there's going to be someone out there or not until you get there. Uh, so it certainly is uh, more difficult, but um, that's the biggest thing is, oh, it's working now. So surface water, uh, I think it was 2009 EPA was sued by an environmental group and they lost and now making applications to surface water is a violation of the Clean Water Act. Now, the Department of Health regulates the Clean Water Act. We don't, but uh, this is basically on most of the labels that you'll be applying. The product is toxic to terrestrial and aquatic plants, fish, and aquatic invertebrates. Do not apply directly to water to areas where surface water is present. So, now if you're out going to spray a field, say they got a rain, you know, three, four days ago, there's some sheet water out in the field. It might be gone in a week or so. You spray across that, you shut off and you go, how do you, how do, you do that? Again, it's gonna be more difficult for aerial than it is for ground applicators, but the moral of the story is if you apply over that water, even though it will be gone in maybe a few days, that's a violation of the Clean Water Act. So now, you know, the Depart I can't speak for the Department of Health and how they do their fining structure and all that type of stuff. I know the potential for steep fines is there, but the biggest thing is it allows for citizen-to-citizen -citizen lawsuits. So now say somebody sees you, say somebody moved up here um, and, uh, you know, as an environmentalist, they see you fly over that water and uh, spray it, they could potentially litigate, litigate against you for violating the Clean Water Act. That's what I really want to make everybody aware of um, so you don't get yourself in uh, hot water there. Now, if it is labeled to be used over water, so that's the first point, it has to be labeled to be used on water. And secondly, before you make the application, give one of these guys a call. And what that is, uh, is you'll fill out a one page notice of intent form. It's a who, what, when, where, and why for the application. And it's, uh, from what I've been told, it's the easiest one in the country to uh, fill out. But, uh, and then you'd get the go ahead after that. Spill kit definition changed a little bit probably since you've maybe heard. It's uh, enough absorbent material to absorb five gallons of liquid, enough impervious containers to uh, contain 10 gallons, and adequate tools to collect it. So if you get a I don't know what a bag of floor dry would soak up, but probably f five gallons, I'm, I'm assuming. So a bag of floor dry, a couple five gallon pails, and a shovel, you'd have a spill kit. You can certainly get those uh, absorbing pillows and all that type of stuff, as long as they meet the minimums there of five gallons and uh, 10 for the pails. If you have a 30 gallon cut off drum, that's obviously more than 10 gallons, so you're good to go. Um, Records, the part that changed, you still have to keep them for three years, uh, but they must be filled out within 24 hours of the application or after the application. And a customer needs to receive a copy um, unless they say in writing that uh, they allow you to keep that copy. Now, is anybody using any smartphone app for keeping the records? I got a question, I don't know, it's probably been a couple years ago now, but. Uh, Somebody asked me if there's a smartphone app for keeping records, and I didn't know at that time, but since then I looked into it. There's one called Pesticide Pal, and what they do is they, they have each state's requirements, so especially for if you spray in multiple states, they tailor whatever state you, you pick will be that state's requirements. And I think they got it up in Canada too. Um, so anyways, you fill that out, you hit submit, then you get an email copy of your record, which then if you had your customer's uh, email address, you could forward on instead of uh, mailing them something. So uh, if you are using an app, just make sure it's one that has our state's requirements if you're spraying in our state. Uh, Cause I know Nebraska has one too, but you know, that's, I imagine that's tailored for Nebraska, not here, so. Safe send. Most of you are probably aware of it. It's a free non-regulatory pesticide collection program. Doesn't cost you anything, just stay in your vehicle, they'll take it out for you. Um, don't bring leaking containers in, leaving a nice trail into the DOT. Uh, that's happened a few times. 
At one time it was a 50 gallon drum of oil, which we don't take, that's not a pesticide, so thankfully the contractor repacked it into another drum and sent them on their way, but um, give me a call if you have any questions on, on uh, what to do there. This year it's gonna change from previous years because uh, last year we collected over 380,000 pounds of pesticides and we went through our budget fairly fast. So this year, we're gonna have 10 sites instead of 12. 3,000 pounds per participant is the max. And once the funding is depleted, the sites will be shut down. So I recommend going to our website the morning of before you head out to wherever you're going because uh, if you don't check, there's a possibility you may drive there and nobody be there. So we'll update our website. Uh, it may not get updated until that evening though, so that's why I say I'd check in the morning. Uh, no rinse aid, no empty containers, pesticides only, which most of you are familiar with the herbicides, insecticides, fungicides, those are all pesticides. Don't bring adjuvants or surfactants in, those are not pesticides, those will be turned away unless you mixed them for some reason, it was a mixed up batch and contaminated with pesticides, well then, then it would be, but. Uh, storage, secure containers if they're stored outside, multiple reasons, theft, vandalism, uh, somebody uh, punctures one of those containers or shuttles or opens up the valve, you'd have a costly cleanup, um, potentially a human endangerment too. Do not, store next, do not store next to feed, food, fertilizer, or seed. And I get a lot of questions on that, on uh, how far away sh do we have to store them? Do we need a separate building or what? There is no minimum distance. It just has to be so if there's a spill or a leak, they won't contaminate any of the other of those items. So just some distance, uh, especially if you got stuff up on pallets, uh, you know, then it uh, definitely helps out too. If you have racks in your uh, sh storage area, if you store the pesticides on the ground level, store the other stuff up. Uh, just depends on how your storage area is, what you got in there. All the label specific PPE, personal protective equipment at the storage site. No open drain, either plug it or it has to be self-contained so it can be pumped out if there was a spill. And pesticide storage signs at all the entrances. The Department of Ag came up with the North Dakota Pollinator Plan. Now, uh, what this is, is it's, it's a voluntary best management practices for applicators, landowners, and beekeepers to uh, try to peacefully coexist. So, I didn't list all the stuff in the, in the plan. You can go to, due to time constraints, but you can go to our website, it's on our website, and uh, or just send me an email and ask for it and I can send it to you. This is a map. Now one of the, that link down on the bottom there highlighted in yellow, you may want to take note of. Um, it's where all the registered beekeepers in North Dakota are listed. It's a way for you to find out where they are. And again, if you don't get this wrote down or you can't see, uh, send me an email and I'll forward you the link. So you click on apiary, select your county, and you get all those dots to pop up. So then you'd find uh, the one that's closest to your area, click the dot, and the contact information of the uh, beekeeper, also lists the landowner, um, gives you the township range and all that. So then you can see if you're making an insecticidal application to see if they wanna cover their bees, move them, uh, try to work something out there. Here's an example of a label. This product is highly toxic to bees exposed to direct treatment or residues on blooming crops or weeds. Do not apply this product or allow it to drift to blooming crops if bees are visiting the treatment area. Now again, this is going to be a lot more challenging for aerial applicators um, because you're going at, what speeds are you going, 140, 150, some, somewhere in there. Uh, so I, you know, that's why I said the map is helpful in the sense uh, you may find out if there's gonna be some real close by. Maybe you could ask the landowner to uh, 
drive out and maybe if <laughs> who knows if they'll give you the right right answer or not because it does fall back on you if there's an incident uh, but uh, I guess if they're bouncing off the windshield then you could safely assume they're out there um, now you may see some labels like this as well and some of these are a uh, result of a case that happened in Oregon and that was an ornamental and turf company, but a Target store asked to, uh, this company to come in and spray their trees because aphids were uh, making a mess on people's cars. And so they came in, sprayed the trees. Well, I guess bees were also visiting the trees. And so then people started calling and complaining because there was dead bees in the parking lot. So the company had to come back, cover the trees. The Oregon Department of Ag suspended, I think, 20-some pesticides from being used and EPA rapidly changed label language on labels. So that's what we want to avoid. We don't want any uh, circumstances like this. Uh, and EPA gets a hold of it. And uh, um, you know, you may have stronger or more stringent regulations. Or they may pull the tool altogether from being used. So this says, for food crops and commercially grown ornamentals, not under contract for pollination services, but are attractive to pollinators. Do not apply this product while bees are foraging. So that's a standalone statement. If they're foraging, you won't be able to apply the product. Do not apply this product until flowering is complete and all petals have fallen unless one of the following conditions is met. The application is made to a target site after sunset. I was visiting with a few of you, and I don't think a lot of you have night vision goggles probably, so probably going to be fairly difficult. Um, the application is made to the target site when temperatures are below 55 degrees. This next one is uh, not going to be applicable, but application is made in accordance with a government-initiated public health response. That's like a vector control or something, or maybe grasshopper control or something like that. Maybe would be applicable, but uh, the application is made in accordance with an active state-administered apiary registry program where beekeepers are notified no less than 48 hours prior to the time of the planned application so they can remove them or cover them. Now that's that map I was previously had up there. So this would be an option for you if you were going to spray a pesticide with this on there uh, to utilize that as an option. And lastly, the application is made due to an imminent threat of significant crop loss and a documented determination consistent with an IPM plan or predetermined economic threshold is met. Then it goes on to say every effort should be made to notify the beekeeper. Now, if you're going to use this as an option, I suggest, um, uh, or the landowner, you can use this as an option, uh, however it works out, I would use a third party, non biased opinion to say, say, if it was soybeans, they're at the 250 uh, aphid per soybean plant. So they need to spray or they're going to face economic uh, uh, damage. I wouldn't say have a buddy or a brother or somebody like that. If, it gets, if there's an incident and it gets called into court, it's going to look a lot better if you had a third party, non-biased uh, person say, whether that's an extension agent or, or whatever. And lastly, there's my contact information. Um, I'm a non-regulatory source for the de department, so I'm not an inspector. Uh, people call me up, I'll walk through their storage areas if they're a dealer, uh, look at records, all that type of stuff. And uh, I don't communicate with inspectors, it's confidential. I'll just simply tell you if something is standing out that you probably should be doing, and that's as far as it goes on my end. So you can always give me a call or uh, shoot me an email. Anybody have any questions over any of that? Questions, comments for Jeremiah? I just had one, and you know when that jogger's jogging down the road? Yep. If the wind's blowing away from her or him, is that okay to just... Psh? I suppose it would depend on how close you are and yeah. stuff. Um, so I can't, it's really hard to answer. Because if, if it comes down to if they feel anything on them, and they call in, and then it comes back with what you were spraying. You know, it's it's you're more than likely going to get a violation. Yeah. Um, and it certainly is a lot more difficult for for you guys than it is for uh, 
ground applicator. I mean, ground applicators, I can see them a lot, you know, better and stuff like that. But uh, just got to be really cognizant uh, of the area and your surroundings. Other questions, comments? Okay, let's give Jeremiah right. a hand. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Our next speaker for your, you here today from the Transportation Security Administration is Paul Missel, here to talk about aviation security. Let's give him a hand. Okay, I'm a transportation security inspector, and uh, but I am not good at the work here. Even though I'm an inspector, we do not inspect general aviation or the egg sprayers. Uh, what we do inspect is uh, commercial airports, uh, commercial air carriers, and uh, flight schools, uh, rail yards, and that type of thing. But we are not uh, inspecting you, so all we are is an information source for, for you for uh, airport security, aviation security. That's all we are. Uh, right now, we have uh, myself, Paul Storr, Nicole Sanford, and Dominic Petzling are the inspectors in the state of North Dakota. Dominic's got the eastern portion of the state. Nicole's got the western portion of the state. You may have met them. They come around periodically, uh, mainly in the summertime, to the smaller airports, and uh, they'll provide you with signage, uh, uh, pamphlets and that type of thing to help you out with the uh, security of your uh, FBOs and, and your particular aircraft. We are expanding. We're going into, uh, we're becoming one AOR with South Dakota, so there'll be nine inspectors. That transition will be at the end of this month. Uh, I have nothing to do with screening at the airports, okay? so. Uh, we, we don't get into anything like that. That's a separate entity within TSA. We actually, in 2001, latter portion, uh, early, latter portion 2002, rather, migrated from the FAA. We used to be FAA inspectors. Paul Storr is the only legacy inspector that we have from the aviation side, and he is a hazmat inspector. Talking about facilities, aircraft, and suspicious activity reporting. Um, the primary thing on your facilities is to ensure that you post contact numbers, police, fire, uh, poison control, and other pertinent numbers somewhere where it's easily accessible to individuals that could be working in with you or even happen to drive up to the airport and see something uh, suspicious. So make sure you post those. Install if possible. I know everything's money driven, but trying to install a security fence, uh, make sure your facilities are locked and other means of preventing unauthorized access to your property. Anything that you can do to protect your systems is, is, is a plus. Lock all gates and doors when your facility is unattended. All valves on bulk product tanks should be secured with locks. Install adequate lighting in all product storage and handling areas. Uh, we've become a pretty diverse area in North Dakota now. Things seem to be migrating from the cities over into North, North Dakota, and there's more activity, nefarious activity going on within the state of North Dakota, especially the Northwest region. Uh, the FBI just opened a branch office up there and so that kind of tells you that there's a lot of activity going on uh, related to theft and that type of thing and drug, uh, drug trafficking and human trafficking going on in the area. So your facilities are vulnerable, even though you may be a small, small uh, 
grass strip airport or something like that. Uh, there's a lot of nefarious activity going on within the state now. Utilize security alarms for your facilities, equipment, and offices. Utilize your local law enforcement. Have them provide periodic patrols. Most of your sheriff's departments are very amenable to uh, conducting patrols of your uh, airfields, your airports out there. They're, uh, we work with them constantly and they're always telling us that they try and get out to the uh, smaller airports on a weekly, sometimes uh, daily basis if they can, if they're close within a patrol zone. Post warning signs on your facilities, not only to warn people, but also to protect you lively uh, if something does, somebody does break into the facility. Locks on hangers prevent uh, unauthorized entry. Use anti-theft devices and lockable control surface <laughs> devices. Utilize, utilize prop and or tail wheel locks. Secure aircraft, remove keys if they have them when uh, unattended. Encourage pilots to escort visitors at all times. Be vigilant, be observant. Anyone trying to access an aircraft through force without keys using a crowbar or screwdriver, if you're at a bigger airport, you may see some individual walking on the uh, ramp out there. If they've got a crowbar, that's probably a pretty good indication that there's something wrong going on. Uh, but make sure that you're familiar with everybody that's at your airports, uh, on your ramp areas. People and groups determined to keep themselves, uh, try to keep th to themselves. If they're uh, nefarious individuals, they generally have, try and stay away from other folks uh, that may be on your ramp area. And look for uh, out of the ordinary videotaping of aircraft and hangars. This can be, you know, from a county road looking, uh, videotaping your ac access points, your facilities and that. Be aware of what's going on. Uh, also, dangerous cargo or loads. If you see somebody land at one of the airports that you're located at, and you see a truck pull up with a, uh, where the individuals look pretty suspicious, carrying explosives, putting them on an airplane, that could be an indication of some other nefarious activity. Or if they come in and land at the airport at night, and a truck drives up and they start loading stuff onto the aircraft, that could also be a good indication that something's not right. Again, be vigilant, be observant. Uh, like I said earlier, that there's, uh, North Dakota's population's becoming more diverse and there is a lot more uh, activity going on. Uh, my office is in constant contact with the State Fusion Center, we do get intelligence uh, briefings and that and if there's something that we're aware of that's going to affect one of the commercial airports or one of the larger GA airports we reach out to those individuals. Also uh, we have a booth, vendor booth, be at the end, DSA vendor bo um, booth. It's got the guidelines to airports, general aviation airport security. Stop by uh, within the next two days pick that up. Or if you would like some uh, signage or anything like that, uh, see something, say something, the DHS program out there, or what we call TSA My Airport program, stop by there, let us know, and we'll definitely uh, provide you with the information. A lot of it's uh, on video uh, or on uh, online, and we can get the link for you to, to send it to you so you can print your whatever signage that you need. Report all unusual activity to the local law enforcement agency first. Use 911. Uh, contact the TSA North Dakota Coordination Center. It's a number up there, or 1866 GA Secure, which is the TSA Transportation Operations Center. Nationally, there's an average of 16 suspicious activity calls a day to the TSA TSOC number. Uh, the most recent in North Dakota was from Pembina. Anybody from Pembina? 
we got a call last fall from Pamina about it. Uh, individuals in a black pickup truck showed up to the airport up there and uh, they were just taking pictures and asking some very weird questions so they contacted us and we in turn contacted the FBI Joint Terrorist Task Force and the CBP. They, they found out the individual was a drug runner uh, and he wasn't doing anything illegally at the time but uh, their observations of him within the next six month period, they actually made an arrest because he uh, flew into another airport in Minnesota, uh, didn't utilize the one up in Pembina area, but flew into Minnesota. And they were able to uh, stop some drug trafficking uh, activity going on. Any questions? Yes, sir. Yep. Or otherwise it would be after we've gone left. And it's like right after we leave, here come a plane come flying in. And uh, I put the tail number in and I looked up to see what kind of tail number it had. Yep. It, had a, it had a helicopter's tail number from way down south. And the FAA, they got the same number. So I don't know what they ever came with that, but that was, either, that was a 150 or, or a 152. So I don't know if you ever found anything about that. But we, we told the guys, I had my guys say, well, if you ever catch them there, you know, let's see who the hell they are because they, they're not even asking. We're a private airport. But uh, so anyway, they came in one time and uh, then they finally fronted them and said, you know, you don't have no permission for land here. You know, why you land here and all that. And then that was the last time they came in. But we never found nothing out who that was or what it was. Who did you report it to? We, we went to the to the, the sheriff department. Oh, sheriff's department? Yeah. And then they get, they called somebody with the FAA yep, to get the yep. tail number. And that's the same tail number I got or you know, went to a helicopter down south somewhere, Tennessee or somewhere. You know, there's so many different reporting avenues. And uh, we've, if you get something like that again, call that, besides the Sheriff's Department, call that 866-GA-SECURE uh, number. And uh, that links it in with uh, the other uh, federal agencies, CBP and uh, the FBI Joint Terrorist Task Force. Mm -hmm. And they'll pass that information out. Yeah, we had them on camera. You know, it's, it's all camera, the whole yeah. place in there. So we had everything. I know I wasn't wrong on the tail number. So that's I thought if anyone ever found a tail number that's like that. Yeah, there, there's a lot of drug activity going on, and uh, they they do a lot of that, that stuff. So, yeah, besides the sheriff, try and, try and get the 18666 GA secure phone number and call that. And like I said, visit the booth out here, and if you want uh, signage, We'll, with the phone numbers and that will provide it to you. And the FAA actually has a regional uh, center down in Dallas. Is it Dallas? Yeah, it's all in Dallas now. Yeah, it's all, all down in Dallas where they do track uh, activity related to drug activity in that. Pretty much anything that's involved with an aircraft, you want yeah. to give the FISDO and Fargo a call or that regional number. Yeah. Most of the time you'll find the sheriff's departments, they haven't got a clue what to do with an airplane. Yep. In fact, most states, uh, North Dakota I know has a few century codes that have to do with North Dakota, Illinois had century codes. Um, you know, there's a lot of states that have no codes whatsoever. And <coughs> the law enforcement has no idea when you tell them about an airplane what they should even think about doing with it. So the best bet is to go with the TSA or to go with the ROC. Uh, give the FISDO a call, and we'll make sure, you know, we get you the answers. Yeah, well, like yeah. I said, our uh, operations center reaches out to the FAA operations centers, to the FBI Joint Task Force, Terrorism Task Force, and that type of thing. So, any other questions? Okay, thank you. All right, let's give uh, Paul a round of applause. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker here for you today is Trevor Woods. He's the Director of Operations for our test site up in uh, Grand Forks, and so he's going to give an update on unmanned aircraft uh, in North Dakota. 
So let's okay. give uh, Trevor a hand. Thank you. So last year I gave this presentation and talked a lot about our broad area COA that we were pursuing and, and did get approved. So this year I'm going to go a little bit more uh, on, on what has happened with the test site and, and then more to a greater extent what has happened with the industry that can affect a lot of you uh, as applicators. Uh, so where we can fly as a test site now, we're actually covering the entire state of North Dakota below 1,200 feet AGL. We do have uh, airport distance limitations in there of uh, at maximum five nautical miles away, but in certain airports we can get down to three and two nautical miles away uh, unless we get a specific COA authorized by the FAA. And uh, we do have one of those. I'll talk about it here in a little bit. Um, class G airspace, day, night, BFR, and 24-hour advanced NOTAMs. Just a note, I know a lot of you were here last year. Our pilots that fly for the test site are all certified pilots. They, you know, they talk on the radio. They do everything that uh, I, would, I would imagine any other manned pilot would do. Um, so I, I'm hoping that you guys aren't scared of us. Uh, where else we can fly is in, in the entire nation. We actually have a 400-foot AGL Class G COA as well. So we can fly anywhere, again, with the five three and two nautical mile distances away from airports unless we get a COA specifically authorized. We are the only test site of the six that has day and night VFR on this COA and also again 24 hour uh, advanced NOTAM uh, that we're, we're allowed to put out to do that. Uh, for the test site itself, 2014 we had 79 operations. Uh, we basically doubled that for 2015 and as of when I checked today, we're up to 120 operations for 2016, so we're climbing pretty fast. We do have some operations slated to be coming up here in the next couple months that are going to uh, increase this count dramatically. So we are increasing our operations throughout the state as well as the nation. Uh, also where we can fly, uh, we have custom codes that we can get anywhere for any airspace, any altitude. The one I'm going to draw your attention to is Hillsboro. This is one that was just authorized by the FAA within the past week. Um, it is a COA by the Hillsboro Airport that actually crosses both of the uh, RAPCON and TRACON for Fargo and Red River. Um, this COA is from the surface to uh, just shy of 10,000 feet MSL. And we're going to be flying an Israeli Hermes 450 UAS out of there, out of the Hillsboro Airport. It's a 1,000 pound aircraft, about 35 foot wingspan. Um, so it's a pretty large airplane. This airplane is going to uh, have the alternative means of compliance for scene avoid is going to be a chase aircraft with a visual observer on board and that uh, chase services are going to be provided by civil air patrol so just be cognizant of that when we do go fly out there we are in full coordination of both Fargo and Red River and uh, and, and we're going to be having a tabletop exercise to run through the whole operation so they'll be hundred percent aware of what we're doing when we're going to be doing it we'll be squawking uh, a, probably a discrete uh, a code when we're up there as well uh, so the radar facilities will have us on site, though we will be VFR while we're operating. It's more out of a courtesy. <laughs> Hobby Recreational has been coming up quite a bit, um, and, and the FAA has put out the Know Before You Fly app, as well as a website that you can go on. Uh, not so much that you guys will be going on there, but just for your awareness, if you see UAS operators out there that are claiming to be hobby recreation, and especially if they're flying in or around an airport, um, encourage you to push them off to this website here. Uh, the recreational use of small UAS is the operation of unmanned aircraft for personal interest and enjoyment. That's an important qualifier there. It really comes down to the intent, what differentiates a hobby operator versus a non-hobby operator. Even if there's not an exchange of funds, if you're providing a service to somebody that is considered a commercial operation, it is technically illegal unless you have the appropriate uh, regulation in place or regulatory approval. For example, using a small U.S. to take photographer f photographs of your own personal use would be considered recreational. That's perfectly fine and legal, but using that same photograph or video for compensation or sale to another individual would be considered a commercial operation. Again, you know, FAA's interpretation of, uh, of commercial does not necessarily mean exchanging funds. So if I take pictures of somebody's field and then provide that to that landowner and they use that to make a business decision, that's technically a commercial operation. It is not hobby or recreational. And the definition of a hobby is the pursuit outside one's regular occupation engaged uh, in especially for relaxation. FAA's definition right there, in case anyone's wondering. Section 333 exemptions have exploded in the past year. Uh, this website that keeps a, a, a count on there it went from you know, 14 or 15 just a, a couple summers ago to now almost 3,800 of these. And the FAA is, is backlogged at headquarters getting these out the door. The important thing for you is that a lot of these operations are small UAS below 55 pounds with some limited exceptions. Uh, they can fly below 100 miles per hour, 400 feet AGL. They do get uh, 
uh, they will get a blanket COA that allows them to fly anywhere in the nation below 200 feet AGL in Class G airspace. So that's important. They also have the same restriction of uh, 5 nautical miles, 3 nautical miles, and 2 nautical miles from certain airports that are uh, listed in their exemption. Uh, these are visual line of sight operations at all times, though it's probably not unheard of that some of these operators might uh, push that boundary just a little bit of what visual line of sight is. They are required to have a visual observer, though the requirements for that visual observer are pretty low. Uh, daytime operations only, I already talked about the five nautical miles, though they are allowed to fly at an airport if they get authorization via COA. The PIC may not operate from a moving vehicle, so they have to stay stationary at any one time. And uh, they also must, those operations must be conducted 500 feet from non-participants. Non-participants are essentially uh, uh, urban environments, houses, landowners that do not give express permission. So this pretty much precludes all of these operations from flying in and around an urban area. But it does happen out in rural areas, most likely where you will be flying. And uh, these pilots are required to have a minimum of an FAA pilot certificate, most of the time a sport pilot license, just an FYI on that. MPRM, when that does come out, the small UAS rule, part 107, is very similar to what the section 333 holders are allowed to do right now with some minor, minor changes. First off, they'll be able to fly 500 feet above the ground or lower. They will not require a visual observer, assuming these, these regulations are approved as is right now. And uh, they will be required to obtain a UA operator certificate. What that certificate is, we do not know yet. It is not defined. So when these rules come into existence, there may or may not be uh, some guidance on what this is. If uh, there is no guidance, I suspect it'll still be an FAA pot certificate until the FAA comes out with something that's equivalent. We are now required to register all UASs, and there's two different paths for that. If we're flying on the public side, like the test site, or any of these uh, 333 operators, or any other type of civil approval that is non-hobby or recreational, they're required to get a uh, uh, registration per 14 CFR Part 47, which is the same registration process that any manned aircraft would go through. They'll get an N number and everything, um, and they have to uh, affix that number on their aircraft. The hobby and recreational users are required to go online and fill out this, uh, this new registration platform here. And that essentially registers the operator who's flying the aircraft. And he or she could have 10 or 15 different drones and that same number will be affixed to any one of those airplanes or all of those airplanes, uh, but they're really registering themselves. Uh, there's confusion out there if you guys see these operators and you confront them. Uh, if they don't have a registered aircraft first, that's, that's pretty much illegal unless it's below, I think, half a pound. Um, and, and B, if they are conducting a civil operation, let's say they're a 333 exemption holder, there's some miscommunication that they register over here, which is not the case. Their exemptions uh, require them to fly, file under Part 47 right there. Airport operations, um, these are becoming more and more, they're, they're going to becoming more and more uh, popular, I, I suspect, this year. Uh, a, a 333 holder out of Grand Forks just recently got approval for the Hillsborough Airport, as well as we as a public operator also got approval for Hillsborough. There will be additional airports that are going to be approved in the near future. This approval is coming from headquarters. It uh, no longer happens at the regional level. And uh, there's two guidances, guidance documents out there, Order 7210.891, as well as an FAQs on the website for UAS operations at an airport. Essentially, the headquarters puts it down to the controlling facility whether or not a letter of agreement will be required. And a letter of agreement uh, is something I'm in, in favor of, though we do not have any say in it. Uh, but basically establishes procedures between the UAS operator and the airport for communication and, and procedures in and out of the airport. Uh, something I think is important, especially for how small these airplanes are, and especially where you guys are flying. I had a lot of slides, so I spoke fast, had to get through a lot of material to give you an update. Are there any questions? Questions for Trevor. I didn't see it. I got. I. I do have. I am registered, but I, it says a number has to be on the airplane, but it doesn't say. It doesn't give any direction at all. There really is no direction. No. So yeah, I mean, you don't meet the 12 inch. You can't put 12 inch numbers on it. You know. So it's just basically if you can find a spot anywhere on it where you can handwrite your number, as long as it's legible. Like we're telling people, if you got a label maker that'll make really small print or. If you can print it out on your computer and put a little piece of tape with it or something so it attaches it, 
but just some way to mark it so that it's got that number on it. How about that letter to operate around an airport? What, what can you tell us about that? Can you expand on that at all? The letter of agreement, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, when, when we are first going down this path of airport operations, the uh, headquarters as well as uh, maybe some of the regional folks down in Texas really didn't know how to approve operations, UAS operations at an airport. So we've been talking a lot to the Bismarck uh, office here on airports, and it was encouraged for us to get letter of authorization with the uh, management of the airport, even though it's not the controlling facility, uh, but at least somebody at the airport knew and understood that we were doing something out at the airport. And, and really the, the LOA that we call, or that we call it, is, uh, is very basic. It just establishes communication procedures between the airport management and ourselves. And uh, we would just essentially say that when we notify via NOTAM as well as the controlling facility that we're going to go fly, we would also notify the airport. And then the airport, we, we would put together a graphic for them to post at the airport to say, hey, there's a, a UAS operations, as, as Jay called them, drone zones. Um, and they would post that at the airport. But since headquarters, uh, recent guidance that came out, uh, the Bismarck office, as, our, as our well as ourselves, no longer has control over that. It is a decision that goes up to headquarters, working with the controlling facility. So for most of North Dakota, they're going to talk to Minneapolis Center, and Minneapolis Center will make the determination if an LOA is required. Unless you're within one of the four approach control facilities, then it'll be on one of those facilities to decide if a LOA is needed. Generally, an LOA is not needed unless you're operating out of a controlled tower facility or unless the operation is complex enough that the FA decides it's uh, with safety in mind that it's, it's required. Basically, the LOA that we worked on with airports and Trevor, they got wind of what we were doing up there and they thought it was so cool. They thought, well, we can't let you do that on your own, so here, <laughs> let's take it from you. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a first experiment, basically, the first time that no. that had been done. So yeah, it was quite a process. Yeah, military's been doing this for a while, but they, they control their whole facilities. You know, the FAA just delegates all that off to them. Um, but what we were doing is, is, you know, public and or civil operations out of a public field. And, uh, and like Jay said, we're, we're kind of experimenting as we went on that. And, yeah. and uh, so now the reason- Well, you were also working with portable substations where they're operating out of, you got guys mechanically walking an airport, walking an airplane down the runway. Yeah. So they might be blocking the runway for a moment or two and just, you know, there's a lot of logistics, so. And, so uh, I've got a GoPro on my quad rotor. And I want to take a picture of the fronts of all the hangars. Do I leave the GoPro on the quad rotor or do I put it on the J3? <laughs> what are you doing with the imagery? Yeah, what are you doing with the imagery? That's it. That's for your own personal use. We really don't have a problem with it. It's got to be for your relaxation and fun, but as soon as you make a dollar from it or even like Trevor was saying, if there, you can, you know, uh, the egg industry, for instance, you use a tractor to make money with. Well, if you take a drone out and they take photos of all your crops and they find that you got X amount of weeds and bugs and everything, and if we put more chemical on and do it, it's actually an advent of the business. So At that point, it's when I get ready to do this, I'm going to give you a call. Please do. <laughs> what are the creative ones I heard was uh, uh, you know a, a farmer had uh, various pots of flowers and, and stuff that he was growing for his own enjoyment but would then strategically place these plots on his many acres of land and go take pictures of them via a drone uh, so I thought that was a pretty creative <laughs> way of uh, maybe skirting the regulations a little bit but trying to anyway yeah, <laughs> yeah trying to <laughs> well it's important if you have any questions about that gray area to give you know myself Jay you know, test site there's people here resources available to help help uh, inform where on the gray area that uh, that you're at, so. Well, for years we had a model airplane club facility out there and they flew all the time. Yeah, and you still, still can. can. Yeah. They kicked them yeah. all off. Yeah. Well, now they can't. <laughs> well, actually, the thing, remember the way the rule reads up there is just you've got to advise the airport. It's yes. between you and the airport. So it's not even, you know, the if airport can say it, no, I don't. I want to advise the airport, that's me. <laughs> well, and that's the thing is that, you know, the, the way it says up there with the airports, whether private, commercial, doesn't matter, airports, is that it's just got to be an agreement that you both understand you can be, you know, you, you can't say you have a right to be there because the airport manager or airport owner, and you're the owner of your own airport, but uh, say like at Fargo, you want to do something there, they're just going to, between air traffic control and the airport manager, they're just going to say, no, we don't want you near the airport, we want you out. But then again, my, some guys might just say, hey, yeah, it's an uncontrolled airport. If you see an airplane, just don't be in the air. 
you know, so it's, it's, it's an open-end agreement. We're not going to say you can't. You know, it's just... Yeah. And it's the problem with doing it verbally, why the MOUs are so important, is it's just like with the egg operators, and we'll talk about that a little bit too, is that you can have all agreements you want between two gentlemen that shake a hand over, yes, you can do that, and now one of them dies and you're out there doing it, and then you get a complaint call <laughs> where we have to come in. It's like, well, who did you talk to? Well, he passed away about three years ago. Or he's in Florida for the winter. We really don't have a way to confirm what you said. Not that I don't believe you, but there's no confirmation. If you get it in writing, you got confirmation. That's the trick, you know. No. It's all about communication to enhance safety. So this this website that has the FAQs for UAS operations at an airport, they also have a separate section on uh, hobby and recreational UASs at airports. A completely separate section. I was, I was wondering uh, what's going to happen if we do hit one. Who's liable? Uh, There's well, million-dollar airplanes out there. Yeah, right now, um, most uh, I'd say at least uh, from the public operations, you know, the test site. Our our mentality is that we're going to we're going to avoid you. Um, you know, the, the onus is on us because we're small. We you know are typically flying visual line of sight, um, but but it really hasn't been tested. You know what what's going to happen? Well, I know guys that have them that are going to go out there and see how close they can get. Yeah, and that's, that's not a good mentality. <laughs> Thanks for being here, Trevor. A couple questions and maybe related to something John just said, but insurance. If um, management at an airport has the right to require an insurance uh, that that particular UAS is insured, I would believe. Uh, we, we have very little control in what John's situation is over there, but if indeed you're somebody's requesting, I definitely would see that they do have an insurance policy. Yeah, that's a good comment. Uh, insurance is one of those things that has been, been coming up in the past six months as far as, uh, you know, a lot of 333 operators. This is a new world for them. They, they have an airplane. They're doing something for a commercial purpose. Now they're getting liability insurance, and these insurance companies are not entirely sure uh, at what cost or what uh, level of, of coverage that they're going to offer. So it's, it's a great comment that you brought up there because it's, it's kind of a new area that's growing. We have a little bit more experience in it on the test site side just given that we're a state entity, uh, but, but it's a new area and, and I would echo those comments, encourage them to have insurance if they're going to be operating uh, near or around your field or any time actually. Any other comments, questions for Trevor? So in Tioga, we might have a drone camp this summer. Can we do that at the airport? <laughs> or what has to be done? You, you know, it, uh, it's hard to answer that right now. Um, I would encourage you to talk to Jay and reach out to him at some point here. Um, but, you know, again, it, if, it's, if it's more of like the hobby recreational side of things, um, mm -hmm. there's likely not going to be any issues unless, as, as long as you're following the regulations that the FA provider, or the guidance that the FA provides. Uh, once, you know, if there's, commercial activity going on or if those are being flown for a purpose and providing information to somebody, again, it doesn't even have to be uh, money exchanging hands there, then, then it's uh, treading in that gray area. But uh, likely you probably just maybe want to have a further conversation. Uh, yeah. I mean, you got to think about it. Airports do a lot of things. They have hot rod shows, they have air shows, they do a lot of different things at the airport. This is just another function that they're doing. So, you know, when you think about it realistically, if the airport management puts out a note of them that there's going to be a lot of drones flying here today and they want to accept the, you know, the risk or whatever, what, you know, they, they put the package together. Uh, the key words are equivalent level of safety for everybody using the airspace. That's what it's all about. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Okay. Thanks, Trevor. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker here for you today, David Gust. He's representing NDAAA, so he's going to give you an update uh, from the association. Let's give uh, David a round of applause. Thank you. We just closed out the uh, Tri-State Convention in Sioux Falls a couple weeks ago, so I'm happy to be at another convention. So soon after that, um, there's a lot of talk about UAS there. Um, Ag is projected to be 70% of the UAS market. Um, and the industry, it seems, is, is pushing autonomous type operations like we're going to be seeing in, in Hillsboro 
This is, this is an aircraft that will take off uh, from the Hillsboro Airport and fly out 20, 30 miles and take pictures of tens of thousands of acres of cropland and provide data on that. Um, why, you know, as a dumb crop duster, I, I don't understand why a, a $30,000 or 172 can't do the same work as this $400,000 UAS from Israel uh, is going to do it. So I, I don't get that, you know. Like, Bob, I'd much prefer to go up in a J3 with a GoPro than use a UAS. But, you know, uh, apparently there's people with more money than me think this is a smart thing to do. Um, a couple years ago when this thing was just kind of starting up, I had a local uh, seed company in my uh, area that was advertising uh, for UAS um, imagery in farmers' fields. And uh, Cindy uh, Schreiber Beck and I got on KFGO on the Joel Heitkamp show and talked about this kind of stuff quite a bit. Um, I went out and watched these guys, the seed company, operate these things. Um, they were all excited about it. And the first field they went out to do it actually commercially, um, the thing shot straight up in the air, a couple hundred feet, turned around, shot straight back down, put a $20,000 hole in the ground. So. You know, it's, 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 I don't know. I, I don't know how well this is going to be used. I don't know if they can go fly over these fields at 5,000 feet and tell you how many uh, aphids there are per plant in your soybeans. They say they think they can. Um, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm skeptical, but, you know, again, I'm just a dumb crop duster. Um, the things we talked about in uh, uh, Sioux Falls is uh, uh, the University of Nebraska is developing a, uh, a large strobe to put in the back of a pickup uh, to warn you that there are up flying UASs in an area. Uh, it's something Cindy and I came up with two, three years ago about you know something like that could could work. Um, that way, if they're out there doing it and you see this large light coming out of the back of a pickup, you know that there's there's a drone operating out of that area. Uh, we also had a speaker from Aperio. Is anybody using uh, their uh, uh, Stratus system in your airplanes? Um, it's a USB um, in. Uh, they could, they're, they're developing a small USB out chip, or not USB, but a uh, ADSB out chip, uh, for, for possibly for drones that uh, if we had this Stratus system in our spray planes, we could actually see drones on our iPads like in ForeFlight. I'm sure we all want more things to look at inside our cockpit while we're out working every day. Um, that's, that's another possibility. Um, you know, the things we can do is always ferry above 500 feet. I mean, it's, you know, when we're going to and from a field, we're part 91, so we got to get up there. Um, you know, I know sometimes the normally aspirated airplanes, are, uh, our service ceiling is less than 500 feet when we're fully loaded, but, you know, get up there. That's, that's the safest place to be. Um, beware of vehicles and surrounding fields, uh, of the field you're treating, um, you know, they're out there for a reason. You know, try to determine what they're doing if they've got a, if they've got a UAS out there or something. Um, the, the scariest thing for me, the COAs and all that, th those guys seem to be on top of everything. I'm not worried about those. It's the, the guys with these, you know, two, three hundred dollar ones uh, that when you're flying close to their, their homes out in the country, they're going to shoot them up in the air so they can take pictures of you while you're working and stuff. And they don't know when you're going to turn and do a headland pass or something and, and, you know, come up against this thing. And you're not going to be able to see it just flat out not going to be able to see it. So, you know, the more communication you can have with the people you're working up against, uh, the better. I mean, that, that's, that's going to be the safest thing, I think. And Cindy, is there anything else? I okay. okay. Um, you know, so, so, you know. so key, though. That's, I think you hit the nail on the head. It's communication. If you can even communicate with um, the growers in your area with, a, with a, a little letter out or an email or something, what you're looking for, and um, just to apprise them of your situation. And I, and I think, again, that insur insurance factor is huge. Um, that's, that's something that's always missing and it didn't come out of the, you know, it wasn't included in the FAA um, requirements by any means. So, and I think the insurance companies in the end may, may regulate this industry like they regulate most industries. So. That's my well, once we start yeah, wrecking some million dollar airplanes, you know, we'll, we'll start seeing some problems. And I, you know, again, my biggest fear is just, you know, some dumber who, you know, who's either thinks you shouldn't be flying around his place or just wants to get close to you and, you know, thinks he's a pilot flying that thing around, 
You know, that's 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 the scariest thing for me, I think, and I think that's the scariest thing for our industry. Um, um, the PASS program this year is really an interesting uh, program on drift and PASS. And I, everybody knows that you're required to take PASS one out of three years for, uh, for your recertification. Uh, that isn't Kyle's deal, so don't yell at Kyle. That's a Department of Ag requirement, and that's something our board agreed to try to push forward because they were worried about drift and they wanted a way to, to mitigate the drift claims. And so if you want to yell at somebody, you can yell at me. I was uh, instrumental in, in pushing that through. But uh, one of the interesting things that passed was they were doing a, a, a module on drift. And they, they put up a, uh, a field up on the, on the screen. And it was this all chewed up, chunky field with all kinds of, of uh, it was a field of winter wheat that the guy wanted killed because it, it had a poor stand. And it was all surrounded by spring wheat that was sensitive. He wanted it killed with Roundup, and there was all this spring wheat around it sensitive. It looked like about a 120-acre field, I would say, when he put it up there. And he asked, how many people here would do this? Well, 95% of the applicators said, there's no way I'd touch that thing. And the guy says, well, what if I told you that was a 13,000-acre field? It was 20 sections was the size of it. And then, every, and then all of a sudden, 95% of the people said, yeah, I could tackle that. Well. And, you know, they showed what happened to it, and they drifted all over the spring wheat that was all the way around it. Um, so that, that was very interesting. And, and another, another situation was where um, he was spraying some, I believe, Roundup Ready corn, and uh, uh, the, the grower he was spraying for called up a neighboring field and said, uh, you know, what's to the north of this? And the guy said, oh, oh that's, uh, I have Roundup Ready corn there. Well, it turned out it was food grade, uh, non-GMO. The, uh, the grower he called was not was confused about the where, what field he was talking about and the applicator drifted on it and nailed it well whose fault is that it's still the applicator's fault you know we got to keep that stuff in the field and we let it go so it, it's still our fault so uh, be very aware of that uh, i think that was that, that's what i came out of pass uh, uh, with the best information this year also uh, we're doing some advertising again. Uh, we have a Facebook page, uh, NDAAA does, and I don't know if anybody, any of you have been peeing in some uh, bars and restaurants in some of the bigger cities. You'll see some advertising there. Um, we're just trying to get you know, our, our face out there uh, so people are aware of us and, uh, and uh, you know, there's uh, something to counter some of these uh, organizations like Toxic Taters and the environmentalists and stuff so that you know, we have a positive spin on it. This year on our Facebook page, they had a, uh, I don't know, how many people are aware of our Facebook page? Okay, yeah, well, we actually, you know, get on there and look at it. You know, I'm not a big Facebook fan. I, I honestly don't care where you went on vacation. I don't care what your political views are. I don't care what you're eating for dinner tonight. Don't take a picture of it and put it on Facebook. Eat it, that's what I do. I mean, you know, so, but this is, you know, this is another uh, good way for us to, uh, uh, you know, to highlight what we're trying to do out there. There's information on there too. Well, there was a photo, uh, uh, photograph con contest on it, and this is the one they picked of an egg cat. So uh, there may, they may do that again this year. So if you get good pictures of your operation and your, your airplanes and whatnot, get it on there. You know, we like to see that. If you, if you participate in an Operation Safe or something, get pictures of an Operation Safe in your area. Get that on the Facebook page. If you'd like to get other information on the Facebook page, uh, Matt Hubness is our, our uh, coordinator on our advertising. Uh, talk to me, talk to him, we'll get it on there. Um, so it's a, it's a good tool for all of us and it's a good place for information. So, any questions? Questions, comments for David? Yep. I, I just don't see how that bathroom advertising in the eastern part of the state does us guys in the west and central. We're in Minot and Bismarck also. Okay. Yeah, it, it, it well, is in my net. I can give you the list of, of the uh, the restaurants and whatnot where we're in. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're in my not Grand Forks, Bismarck, also. Okay. So, and if you you know if you see a place where we could be in Wilston, I, I don't know that they I don't think they have anything like that there yet. But you know that's, that's and it, it's it's you know it, it, we're not trying to get business with it. Yeah. We're trying to get public awareness, public awareness. of okay. us. That's that's what we're trying to do there. We're trying to counter some of the negative stuff with with positive messaging. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to reach, you know, the housewives who think, you know, GMO is a boogeyman. You know, uh, you know that's that's what we're trying to that's what we're trying to do with that information. Sure. Uh, one more question that um, you said that they could implant a chip in these drones that we could 
somehow activate or yeah, it would be an, find, an, an, an ADS-B out, right? You know, which is what you know, and all pl air airplanes that kind of fly in some of these yep. airspaces, like uh, uh, Bravos and whatnot, you have to have that ADS-B out. Most of the new airplanes and airlines have them, and uh, it, it would emit a, a, a signal that you could pick up with the Stratus system, and it would show up on your iPad. Do you fly with ForeFlight at all? Yeah, okay. I do my personal play, but on my aviation. Right, yeah. right, but it would be the same thing yeah. if you, you, you'd, you'd uh, put one of these uh, Stratuses in there, mm -hmm. and that would receive that signal from that, from that uh, drone. I mean, it, it, they think it's a possibility. Again, you know, do we need more stuff? Yeah. inside our cockpit that we're taking our attention away from you know, what we're doing. You know? Yeah, that come up at the national meeting too, and the one guy got up and he uh, he suggested a tone that would go off in your helmet when a drone would be like within a 30 mile radius or something. I thought that was a good suggestion. Like when a surface to air missile locks on you. Yeah. Same principle, yeah. <laughs> Other comments, questions? Great, let's give David a round of applause. And thank you so much for all of your advocacy and educational efforts that you're doing around the state. That's really appreciated. And so with that, our last speaker okay. for everybody today, uh, Jay Flowers from the Fargo Fisco office is gonna talk about uh, more on unmanned aircraft, uh, aviation uh, accident statistics, and a whole assortment of of uh, good tidbits. So. Trevor, Trevor covered more than I could. Because <laughs> really there's not much for us to say right now. How's that, okay? All right, thanks. That's good. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you. Well, um, how much time do I have? Because I know we were, that was one of the things. 30, 40 minutes. Actually. Okay, I want to try to, don't want to get you guys, I don't want to keep you too long because I could talk for four hours and it wouldn't matter. Um, <laughs> Well, a little bit of what we covered, and this is kind of the same thing I gave down at the Tri-State. So I'll cover you with that information. Uh, a little bit of action review of what we've had happen over the last year, so you have an understanding of what egg-related incidents we've had. We'll talk a little bit of regulation, uh, things to think about for the upcoming year, things that you guys are required to keep up and to maintain. We'll talk about uh, uh, the FISDO's concerns. I've found some new data on wind turbines that really opened some eyes, so I want you to kind of absorb that a little bit. And uh, the UAS portion, I'm kind of leave that alone because like I said, Trevor did a really good job covering that. So uh, in the last year, we've had, and this is looking back to October 14th, so uh, basically what we've had is we've had two egg-related aircraft accidents, uh, or excuse me, three. We've had two, uh, well, actually two accidents, one incident, excuse me. Um, and uh, nobody hurt, thank God, I mean just minor injuries which it always amazes me when I see these accidents and see what's left of the aircraft, there's nothing there, you know. So, um, first one that we've got in the big bang, this one here we had an engine failure, essentially. Uh, ended up with a cracked cylinder and some oil running. And I apologize if it's any of you that uh, this has happened to. Um, I try to keep it as sterile and as simple as I can from the NTSB website um, for information. Uh, but essentially, uh, the pilot was able to set it down in the field while well, when he got on the brakes, uh, that's when the damage occurred to the aircraft. So he didn't want to go into a fence, which I can't imagine ever getting scared when something's coming at you at 65 miles an hour and wanting to stop in a hurry. So uh, just thank God nobody was injured on that one. Um, so that's kind of pretty much a fixable airplane, I'd say, uh, with the broken gear there. So uh, we had a propeller failure where the outboard 14 inches of one of the blades just departed the aircraft. One of the issues we're finding with that, and uh, we started to notice uh, on a few different uh, propeller dressings, how many of you are mechanics in here as well on your aircraft? Okay, something to think about, and this is something we've seen for some reason, we're starting to see uh, a few incidents with propellers where the propeller is not being dressed correctly. And this brought to me by our maintenance division. Instead of dressing it along the length of the blade, they seem to think it's pretty cool to just round that baby out until we got like a quarter notch in her and let her go. And that's just not the way you dress a propeller. And so we found that on three separate incidents in the last year. And all three of those incidents, when you started to check the blade very closely, the, the propeller was cracked. 
um, because the, the actual the, the portion that was missing was so deep that it was starting to fracture crack in the blade. So uh, the aircraft were grounded and of course the propellers replaced. In this particular instance they couldn't do it. Um, it departed while they were still in flight. So, And as you remember a couple of years ago we had a 172 that was set down in the field just outside of Fargo there. Um, the propeller separated off of that because somebody had tried to repair the blade by using JB Weld and a good can of black spray paint. Well that lasted for who knows how long but uh, that was pretty interesting also. Uh, this one here was what we call a sea fitter controlled flight into terrain. Um, power lines. You know, it's, it's, there's a lot of things out there we can hit as pilots. And then for you guys, I feel sorry for you because now you got wind generators and you got power lines and you got, you know, unmanned aircraft and you got all these other things you got to worry about. In this particular instance, uh, the gentleman uh, come off the end of the field and uh, hey, it's about all that's left of that airplane. It's not much. It's a sketch. Essentially, when he hit the wire, it sheared one wing off, took the canopy off, and the aircraft ended up a few hundred yards down the road in the middle of the field. Um, yeah, you can see exactly right. Yeah, you can see right here. That's a, a section of, uh, I don't know if it's the wing or part of the canopy. So, I mean, <laughs> I, uh, I feel your pain when I see you guys flying around this stuff. So, uh, one of the things that I'm going to bring up through this presentation is one other pain that got brought to my attention, so it uh, made it quite... Uh, something else to think about but yeah you can see there's not much left of that airplane so um, that's a big engine land in the field okay CFR regulations and all I want to cover with on this is just some of the brief regulations that keep in mind that change that we get busy we forget about okay administratively administrative action you want to go with amendments to certificates okay by that I mean if you guys change business names we're seeing a lot of large corporations buying out small businesses. Names are changing. Maybe you became an LLC because of insurance. Uh, maybe you became incorporated. Things like that. Okay. Make sure you like to let the FISDO know that those changes have taken place. If you have a name change, make sure that you also include the incorporation of papers that have been sent off to the state to prove the name is valid. And just uh, send that to your inspector. Uh, 19EV, this came out, believe it or not, in 2010, or excuse me, 2011, where it talks about knowledge and skill. And this is one thing that I've hung my hat on for quite some time in the FAA is the fact that your knowledge and skill test has got to be based on the performance capabilities and operating limitations of the aircraft you're using. So for you guys that have some really gray hair that maybe got your knowledge and skill in a Pawnee, do you think that knowledge and skill is still good for your 502 or, your, or some other aircraft? Probably not, okay? According to this rule and how it's written for the aircraft to be used, if, if you, nothing else, and this is all I ask you to do, and we discussed this down in South Dakota, what I expect you to do is at least log in your logbook somewhere that you at least visited the performance specifications, the weight and balance, the oddball characteristics that might be for that particular one that you're flying. So as an operator, if you hire a guy that's never ever flown, say an air tractor, maybe he's ever, all he's ever flown is a thrush or maybe it's been a Pawnee, at least, at the very least, he may have a knowledge and skill endorsement in his logbook, but go through and retest him on the equipment for that exact aircraft. Time and again, guys will step out of an airplane after an accident and here's a full load of chemical laying in the middle of a field and they actually go, well, why didn't you pull a handle? You know, I think the airplane would have been a little bit lighter when it hit the ground. Well, I wasn't sure how the aircraft would operate if I pulled the handle. Okay, knowledge and skill says we should know how that aircraft's going to fly when that chemical starts to leave that bin. So all I ask you to do is if you've never flown that type of airplane or never pulled the emergency dump panel in that aircraft that you're flying today, fill it with water to whatever your normal batch file would be, your normal flight out would be. Take it out over the, run over the runway and dump it. Get to know what it feels like. Besides that, if you haven't done it for a while, the technique is pretty specific in the regulation as to how you're supposed to fly the aircraft out of that situation. And the time to learn that is not the day it happens. You know, it's hard enough we're trying to remember things that happened 25 years ago. So try to do that from time to time. Go out and see what your emergency dump panel's like. 
Um, operating limitations is also part of that knowledge and skill. It has to do with the stall speeds of the aircraft, maneuvering speeds, density, altitude. I'm not going to get into CAM 8. However, I will be available at the table out here to discuss that for those of you that need some discussion on CAM 8 and CAR 8 and how that works, so we do that correctly. But a lot of that has to do with the maximum weight and balance for your aircraft and how, that's all, how that all goes for your aircraft when you're flying it. So uh, just mainly keep in mind that CAM 8, if it was endorsed under CAM 8, that does not follow the next aircraft owner. It has to be done by each aircraft owner to be qualified. Um, knowledge and skill, also handling characteristics, we talked about that, the emergency dump and payload. Duration of your certificate is until you until it gets suspended or revoked or you turn it in. And to keep in mind that one of the things we run into is, uh, with the certificates is, is if people say, well, I don't have an aircraft. And we know you buy and sell aircraft all the time. All I need to do as an inspector is I need to know you're working on it. Then again, we have some guys that worked on it for five years and still haven't gotten an airplane. So if you're really thinking about getting out of it, let us know. Because that certificate now under the current system is going to require a lot more surveillance from your principal if you don't have an airplane. Um, so if you want to keep us out of your office, you need to let our office know what's going on. Okay. Um, you may deviate from the parts of Part 91, but only for your dispensing operation. Essentially, this is get down to, you know, what Dave was saying. Um, we're not saying you have to be 500 feet en route because the law doesn't say that. The rule doesn't say that because we have a lot of open territory around here. But you've got to be 500 feet from buildings, people, property. And keep in mind that someone in their car, that's their property. Okay? Um, so that's the main thing is just kind of watch your en route stuff. Um, Every year we'll get two or three phone calls that says, I was just going down the gravel road and this guy just about took the top right off my camper. Did you get an end number? No, but it was yellow. <laughs> so the thing you got going for you is they're all the same color. <laughs> all right, carrying a certificate, the only thing you have to carry is a copy of that operating certificate, okay? Everything else you can leave in the safe back at the building and I'd expect you to. Registration, airworthiness, even your operation specifications that you're all uh, filled into, I think it was about four years ago now already, uh, we call them web ops or whatever it was, which web ops is mainly for air carriers. Well, it's the only tool they had, so they made it work. So, but make sure you have a copy uh, and take a look at your operating certificate copy that's in your aircraft, as well as all your paperwork and make sure that all the dates and names and <laughs> addresses and all that stuff that's on there is still current, okay? Just kind of update yourself. Uh, limitations on private operations, you know, no operations for compensated to hire, no operations over congested areas, okay? Um, congested area, remember, can be any building, it can be an outhouse with two people in it. The point is it has to do with the, the basically the congestion of buildings or a congestion of people in those buildings can be considered a congested area. It doesn't have to be the yellow mark on the sectional chart, okay? Uh, personal use, each person used in the holder's agricultural aircraft operation must be informed of that person's duties and responsibilities. Supervisors especially need to let you, your underlings if you want to call them, or if we want to be a little more funny about it, guys in yellow airplanes, we can call them minions. But we can say that when you guys are out there flying around, make sure that you know what your duties and responsibilities are, and then of course the knowledge and skill tests that you're required to have. Um, performance capabilities, we'll hit that once more time. 3741 personnel, uh, knowledge and skill demonstration is not necessary when, okay, and I got to read this because I got to get it right. At the time of the filing of an applicant by an agricultural aircraft operator is working as a pilot in command for that operator. I'll let you study that if you would like to because it's easier sometimes to just read it and say this is what it is. So basically if there's a, a procedural process during certification, it's going to depend on how your knowledge and skills are required. Operations in controlled airspace designated for an airport, ATC air traffic. I have, we talked a little bit about airports out there, of course, if, you know, nothing says you can't spray like around the Fargo airport. You just got to get approval from airport authority. You got to get approval from Fargo track on to do that and, and to be in that airspace. Because we have, uh, Illinois killed me because I have never seen so much corn growing on an airport in my entire life. You know, how many of you saw, were, uh, were looking at some of the videos of the time 
when uh, uh, that uh, DC-10 crash in Sioux City, Iowa, and all the people came walking out of the cornfield. My God, this corn is tall. It's 10 feet high. You know, and so they put this around airports. So you know that uh, that's probably the best arresting cable there is known to man is this tall corn if you do go off the runway on an excursion. Uh, but uh, make sure that you uh, talk with the airport management as to be on that field. So my point being with that is there's crops on the airport. You might need to spray them, you know, but just get your permission. Now, for the uncontrolled airports, uh, some of the stuff we talk with that is, uh, let's see if it do it, yeah, non-observance of airport traffic patterns. Like I said, a handshake is good. In writing is way better, okay? Out there on the table out the front, when you guys come in, I've got some memorandum of understandings that we developed a while back. They've been around for now about four years. Um, please grab those and update your, your, your agreements with these airports to do right-handed traffic or opposite traffic as approved. Keep in mind that the airport manager is the one that sets the precedent of left-hand right tra traffic. They're the ones that do that. The airport's division does nothing with that. It's all the airport manager. Um, so your agreement is with them as to do it. But the key is if a normal, well, let's not say normal, because we are talking some of you and D pilots that come in, and that's not quite normal sometimes. Excuse me. <laughs> but when pilots come flying in, general aviation comes flying in, they are given the right of way. You must flow the traffic the same as they do. So if the traffic's right-handed, left-handed, whatever it may be, that's what you must fly as egg operators. Um, if you have agreements with, you know, or say if you have issues with this thing did come up with some of the UND folks, um, they're coming into the airport a lot during heavy egg operations. Well, they may be able to work it out with UND that says, okay, if you stay to that runway, we'll stay on this runway and we'll stay out of your way. But that's all in agreements, you see? So it's, it's kind of like the old adage, if dad doesn't know about it and doesn't get involved in the middle of it, he's not going to kick my butt. So that's what you want to do. You want to work it out. Um, this is kind of what that memorandum looks like. And in a nutshell, it's just reverberating the, the regulation as to what you're allowed to do and, not, uh, and shouldn't do. Um, airport management should sign this as well. And keep in mind that airport manager does not mean airport authority. You know, some of these places have both, so. Okay, business names. Make sure your business name is correct. We talked about that. Uh, your records, commercial records. A lot of these companies are getting quite large. In fact, a lot of the seat companies are now going out and doing the selling for you, so all you have to do is spray it. So who's got the record? They do. Make sure you're getting copies of those spray records. Because when we come in and we look to see what you sprayed on what property and where, we need to be looking at that information as well. Uh, and those records must be retained for 12 months. Change of address could be just as simple. You move from one airport to another, but make sure you let us know. Um, these are the pages of the op spec pages of the ops pages. Again, a lot of it has to do with authorizations, addresses, end numbers of airplanes, types of airplanes. You guys are buying and selling them all the time. Make sure you're keeping that up to date with the FAA and your congested area plans and authorizations are all done through there as well. Okay, physical concerns, AD compliance. Just like when Andy was talking about what we're finding is we're still finding the same problems today we basically had four years ago. We're getting to the point where we're getting the annuals done and the AD maybe still had 30 hours to go, so they didn't do it. So 25 hours after you get it out of annual, the ADs do. Well, if you didn't know that, you're going to fly right over it until you get your crop season done probably for the year. And either that or something happens like one of those accidents, and then the FAA finds it. So please start tracking your maintenance better than, than you have. I mean, take charge of that. Uh, seriously, I mean, uh, in industry we had, uh, when I was working for executive, for instance, we had 14 aircraft we had to keep track of all on 135, all needing 50-hour, 100-hour inspection, hose changes, you name it, just a plethora of stuff. And the status board was literally a three-foot by six-foot sheet of glass that had every aircraft on it that you could think of when you start adding in propellers and fire extinguishers. And I mean, it's all there. But the long and short of it was is in the 23 years that I was there with that board established, we had maybe one or two incidents that I can remember where we overflew maintenance. 
you know, and that's a lot of flying. So please do what you can to keep track of everything you got there. Uh, Owner-operator maintenance is a, is a partial issue still. Uh, last year we had an uh, egg uh, aircraft that took off and all of a sudden the right main goes off into the field because he over torqued all the wheel bolts. Well, owner operator maintenance doesn't say you can't change your own tires, but it also tells you that you should probably use a torque wrench to put the bolts back in. Some of those bolts were over a half inch longer than what they were supposed to be. He torqued them that much. <laughs> so, you know, even though you can, make sure you can do it correctly, okay? Um, outdated web ops, again, go through, check them out. Operating non-authorized aircraft, again, check your aircraft to make sure you're listed and maintaining the required records. Wind turbines, this is the part I wanted to get up to the most because this part really, when I started thinking about it, opens the door up for you guys for some drift issues. And we all know these buggers are out there. You know, they're sitting, on the, sitting out there in fields and fields of them, hundreds of them. And I had a gentleman walk up to me at a safety meeting and said, you know, I've got a private airport just west of Bismarck, or excuse me, just west of Fargo. And when they put in the wind turbine fields, at first they had one right in the center of my airport. Of course, that prompted me to go to their meeting. So now they moved them a quarter mile off my airport. But he said, given the wind on a certain day, he said, there's days I can't land at my airport. He said, the turbulence is so bad that I literally can't get my airplane on the ground. And I'm thinking, okay. And he says, he, he blamed the wind turbines. I thought, well, you know, wind turbine, what can that be, you know? Okay, so me being me, I get on the internet and I start looking at some data and information. And uh, I'm gonna zip ahead here a little bit. And I started looking at some photographs and some studies that they started doing, some different organizations about wind turbines and associated wind drift that comes off of these turbines. These turbines essentially are all sitting on a lake bed. And this picture, what it's depicting almost perfectly is how the turbine is generating disturbed airflow coming all the way back one to the other and continuing across the back of the, the field of turbines, okay? So I said, well, let's see what else they got to say. Well, they came up with this wake structure that comes off of a wind turbine, okay? The wind turbine itself seems innocent and rough, where the blade is spinning, making its airflow and making its energy, but it slowly but surely turns into a wake vortex very similar to that we would find coming off of like a heavy aircraft, 757, 747, bigger aircraft. The turbulence, in fact, gets so disturbed to the back that it eventually beats itself to death and turns it, shuts itself off. It's almost like the double wave effect where it starts cutting itself away. But what got my attention was this. Now the whole reason for this study, you got to remember, first of all, the main reason they did this study was because they were burning up turbines standing up on the, on the towers. They couldn't figure out what was going on, and essentially what they found out was is that once the wind hit more than 27 knots, it would hit the front of the turbine blade, travel up the blade, off the tip, and was actually creating a vibronic torque at the hub of that turbine, over 27 knots. Well, that started to eat the turbines up because now it's starting to fracture those blades and start to cause all kinds of blade issues up in that hub. So with that study, they decided that 25 knots is probably the maximum speed that they would do because then they don't get the damage. Well, in the process of this study, they also started to notice that when these two, when turbines are aligned, that the second turbine section here, the turbulence gets quite large. Now keep in mind that these turbines are 1,800 meters apart. So 1,800 meters times three is what? 5,400 feet, so about a mile apart. So what they're saying is, is that when they did this study, that once that turbine started to break the air up and flow around, almost a mile behind it, it's still turbulence. When it got into the second turbine, when the two were in line, the worst was the nearest to the tower because it's starting to beat that wind again. Really odd was this line right here is roughly 500 feet above the ground. 
So now if we take a look at that, that turbulence being formulated or being pushed out by those wind turbines, it is very possible that a quarter mile from his private strip, if one of these towers and the wind is just right, the turbulence could be so bad he can't get that airplane on the ground. So now, one of my other guys there says, well, hey, I'm an egg pilot. What do you suppose that does to drift? Now, keep in mind that this day, it was done on a 15-knot day. Your guys' cutoff is mostly, what, about 10 knots? Okay, so take that number, even on the safe side, and cut it in half. So now we're still talking 900 meters from the back side of those towers, or roughly a half a mile from those towers, it's still producing a certain amount of energy that could cause you drift with your fields. So please keep that in mind when you're out there and you're spraying and you're anywhere near these guys and the wind's flowing in the right direction. You could be getting a drift issue from that right there. It's a scary thought. It's a simple thought. But now how do you control it? I'm just the messenger. <laughs> you know, I'm just here to tell you that it's a possibility it's out there. And again, the concern is, is that it was up to 500 feet. So now say you're cruising along and you're half a mile behind these towers and you're 200 feet off the ground. You might encounter that wake while you're out there flying behind these towers. Okay, and the UAS stuff I'm going to skip through. And that's basically all I got. Any questions? I'm here to answer if I can eat. I do have one, Jay. Yes. Anything specific from a safety issue? We, we have these wind towers going up in, in sometimes relatively close to airports. Yeah. And has the FAA issued anything? And I would really like to see this data go to uh, our PSC, our Public Service Commission as well. Mm -hmm. it, it seems like we've, okay, this is no one, but right. we're not doing anything with the information. Right. This is one thing that I saw that scared me to death. And let me bring it up here. Come on, where are you at, cursor? Let me just run through this quick. This is one I chose to skip in the beginning, but this is something that scares me when it comes to these towers, this advisory circular. It doesn't mention that. Okay, this advisory circular right here is about obstruction lighting. So you guys can see them. Now you operate during the day, okay? So really these things are big enough, you should see them. The Met Towers are still an issue, we know that. Um, but say you're ferrying your airplane, and you guys not only are AG pilots, but you're, you're normal GA pilots as well. This came up, and I read this and I about skipped a beat. Basically what they're allowing these wind generators to do is these wind farms, is they're letting them use, what's the exact terminology? automatically active anytime an aircraft comes near them. So if an aircraft is a thousand feet above or three miles off to the side, these things, the lights are activated on those towers. So it could be the dead of night and that field would be completely black. You won't see one of those towers out there. Now if they're not in North Dakota where the wind's blowing 45 miles an hour in the middle of a snowstorm two o'clock in the morning, Let's say it's not even a snowstorm. Let's just say it's 2 o'clock in the morning and the wind's blowing 40 miles an hour. Are they still going to be able to hear that aircraft 1,000 above, 3 miles away? That's a pretty good sensor. But that's what's going to turn those lights on to let you know that those fields are out there. And it's an option. It's not the way that everybody's going to do it, but it is an option for seeing these towers. Now, as far as the safety-related information, like you're asking with some of these towers and how they affect flying and whatnot, yeah, there really hasn't been much. I feel that there will be some with the advent of the accident in South Dakota. I mean, here we got a guy that flew, ag, he was flying ag for years. Had flown around those turbines ever since they put him in for almost 10 years. And then he decides to come home scud running one night and he hits the tower and it cuts the airplane in half. Kills him and the three people he had on board with him. You know, here you, here you gotta go, okay, his, his decision-making process obviously wasn't working for him that night, and neither was his memory. 
because he forgot they were even out there. You know, and God help us all. I mean, I've been out there too for years. Things start to go bad. What do you do? Eh, let's try lowering it down 100 feet, maybe 200 feet. You're so busy trying to see the deck that you will forget about what else is down there. You know? And so, I, I, yeah. other than specifics on your question, I don't really think there's been anything out there that's really been working safety related towards local airports, other than the fact that we're keeping them from encroaching on airports, especially commercial airports, on things like that. But as far as private airports, you got to be active. You got to see when those fields are coming in and you got to go in and talk to people. Uh, several people have said, yeah, they, put, they were putting one of those turbines right in the center of my airport. Well, the problem was, is yeah, he had an airport, but he never registered it with the state. <laughs> you know? So my advice is if you're going to put in a private airport, register it with the state so at least somebody knows it's there. There's no requirement to do that. Well, and real quick, JB, reg yeah. registering actually with the, the federal government. So the state doesn't register okay, that's what private federal, airstrips, yeah. but even then, uh, private airstrips really aren't, um, there's no protection for private airstrips. No. Um, it's no. kind of a... But if it's registered, generally it seems like the people that do have these turbines are at least thinking about it and saying, well, we'll move them away. Yeah. You know, they understand that part of it. Well, and there's a public comment process, and so, yeah. you know, we can go to the Public Service Commission and make our case, you know, as a private airstrip owner that this is affecting my operation. And we've done that in the past, and we can yeah. continue to do that. But the regulations protect our public use airports uh, right. in North Dakota. And so whenever, whenever anybody wants to put in uh, these wind farms, they have to get approval from the FAA in regards to the distance, height, away from an airport. Yeah. But and, you know, and turbulence is not factored too. in, so yeah. that's a good point. Well, and um, that's done through a completely different division. Yeah. Um, out of Atlanta, I think it is, it has to do with towers and structures. Yeah. They, it's, it's like this hand does towers and structures and this hand does airplanes. <laughs> they don't talk to each other. So you just need to be active when you see things like that coming into your area. Oh, good points. And so if there is a wind farm coming to your area, you know, locally we have the ability to, to, to change. Make a voice. You know, by, by voicing your opinion about your, the concerns that you have. And so it's, it's important in moving forward. And the same goes way. with any kind of tower. I yep. mean, you guys have a voice on this. If you yep. see towers in certain areas you know are going to be creating a problem, all you have to do is get in touch with us and we'll get you to the right people. Yep. I also want to remind everybody that they can log on to the Aeronautics Mission website and look at all the Met Tower uh, locations yeah. throughout our state. Department of Agriculture is also a good uh, site for looking at the beehives and, and the vineyards and, and the organic farms. The new website's so, fabulous, by the way. Yep, so I like that. I, I hope everybody uh, uses that information to their benefit. And so, yeah, it's a great comment. Any other questions or comments for Jay? Nothing new. Cool. Okay, let's, well, gi let's give him a round of applause. Thanks. Thanks. But uh, just to close off, uh, I once again just want to thank all the speakers that came to visit with us today. I really pre appreciate all of you coming and taking your time to, to be here in person and everybody watching online. Uh, thank you for taking the time. I also remind, want to remind everybody here to make sure that to, to sign your name and Sheila's sign-in sheet so you can get credit. If you're watching online, make sure that you take the, the questionnaire at the end of the video so we can ensure that um, you are complying with uh, the state North Dakota Aeronautics Commission uh, regulations in regards to being an active aerial applicator in our state. I hope all of you can join us uh, at the Upper Midwest Aviation Symposium Social tonight at the Heritage uh, Museum starting at 5 p.m. Uh, through 9 p.m. So uh, please come up and, and join us uh, this evening. And uh, I hope all of you have a, a great uh, conference, and I hope we have a successful and safe spring season. So thank you so much.